I'm sorry for the, the little delay. It's just that there is uh, one of the speakers that is speaking from Brazil, and we are just testing um, the camera. And also, she will need us to go through the presentation because she's going to you know, show some PowerPoint, and we're going to be doing from here because she's not uh, being able to access the link via her computer, so we have to to do it. But anyway, I'll start um, by introducing myself. I'm Raquel Renov from Article 19, I'm Program Officer, and I'm responsible for connectivity issues. And I work mostly on infrastructure level and standard setting organizations. My work specifically is in the ITU, ITUR. And here I'm followed by um, Natalia Lobo, who is online, and she's the director of the sectoral policy department of the Ministry of Communications of Brazil. Then Robert Pepper, uh, the head of global connectivity policy and planning, ex-FCC, ex-NTIA, and consulted to other um, regulators and have a vast experience in spectrum management. Um, then Jane Coffing, also an expert with uh, extensive experience in the technical community, um, public sector, private sector as well. And she's um, currently a consultant and an expert um, providing information on com community networks, IXPs, inter interconnection, peering, and community development. And Thomas Loninger, there is the executive director of the Digital Rights uh, Epicenter Works in Vienna, Austria, and also works a lot uh, on net neutrality issues, uh, specifically in the European Union, but not limited to European Union. And this is going to be an open discussion. We're going to take questions and comments from the people here in this room, but also uh, online. And the idea is to bring different views. Um, you can see that we have people from different backgrounds here. Um, basically, the idea is to uh, update and bring different views on the connectivity issues. Uh, a lot has been said about uh, how connectivity is important, how it's a human rights enabler, sp specifically after the, um, the um, pandemic. So even the right to health was something that was uh, related to, to connectivity lately. But we still face digital divide and we have uh, new kinds of digital divide. And also some people say that we have many digital divides. And the SDGs still frame access as a development issue, and, but then we are facing a human rights um, issue. So there are two different um, ideas and assessment of what the, the right to um, access the internet, not as a human right, but um, also not just a commercial service, how it should be tackled, not how it should be seen, how it should be framed. So we are here together, these different ideas, and also understand if any connectivity is good connectivity and what are the challenges and opportunities that we might have nowadays. So I would like to start uh, with Natalia, if possible, or not yet, Lucas. Ah, uh, okay. Okay, so we're gonna start by the people in this room and then we leave Natalia for later. Is it okay? Okay, so we can start by, please, Pepper, if you can oh. start. Please. There, I think that, yeah. that, that works better. Thank you very much. Um, and it's great to be here. Uh, and thank you for the invitation um, on the panel. So. Just maybe to start things off a little bit, um, uh, one of the things that I've done with, at Meta with the Economist Intelligence Unit, it's now called Economist Impact, was we had started a study 
um, back in 2017, and it was a six-year time series called the Inclusive Internet Index. And it looked at 54, 55 indicators for 100 countries, and you know, you've seen some of this. Um, uh, Brazil does quite well. Um, and we, early on, uh, you know, the issue on connectivity was coverage. People did not have available to them a broadband connection. Over the last six or seven years, we, and about three years ago, we saw a shift from a coverage gap to a usage gap. And the latest data provided by the uh, ITU and the UN Broadband Commission three weeks ago in New York at the, um, uh, their annual meeting before the UN General Assembly met was that 95% of the world's population now has available to them a broadband connection. There's about 400 million people out of the 8 billion people that do not have a, a broadband connection available. And that remaining 400 million will be served by satellite. And that was you know, a general conclusion, not just by the Broadband Commission, but by GSMA, the mobile operators, satellite operators who were there in the room. And that becomes extremely important. Um, on, the, on the other hand, there's two, about 2 billion, 2.1 billion people who could be online who are not online. That is the usage gap. So there are about 2 billion people not connected, and then there are people who are underconnected. And this goes to the question about what is meaning, you know, about meaningful connectivity. Um, and so the question is, why are they not connected? So one of the other projects we did with The Economist was they surveyed people in sub-Saharan Africa who were not online in about 23, 24 countries. And what they found, these are the people who are not online, all right? The vast majority had a connection potentially available. The number one reason was affordability of devices and affordability of monthly service. The second reason was, um, uh, the way it was framed was, I don't know how to use the internet or what to use it for. Digital literacy questions. Um, the third major reason was the lack of local relevant content, which also goes to the question of why should somebody be on. Um, and then there's a separate issue with electricity. No electricity, you're not, even if you have devices, you're not gonna be able to charge them and so on. Um, so we've seen this shift from a coverage gap to a usage gap, which is about adoption but why is that important? It's important because of the focus of the, of the session. Um, being online, and we especially learned this during the pandemic, provides access to services that are directly related to fundamental human rights. Education, the ability not just to receive information, but also to speak and create information. This is, this is really fundamental when you take a look at Article 19, not just the organization, but Article 19. Um, one of the things that The Economist did as part of this project was to go into the field in each of those hundred, well actually there were, it was 98 countries because two countries do not permit surveys. Um, so they couldn't go in the field for a survey in two of the countries, but 98 countries. Uh, and they asked people, what they called it the value of internet survey. What do you use the internet for? How do you value it? And what do you, you know, how has it improved your life? And in the last two years of the pandemic, it was specifically focused on questions about well-being. And what was interesting is, um, especially during the pandemic, um, the vast, and it actually it change, it, it, it's by region, it's differences in some of the regions, but um, questions about education, the way people use the internet for education for their children during the pandemic when things were shut down. 
And what was a little bit surprising was that people in sub-Saharan Africa felt that being online was more important than people in Europe for education for their children. Across the world, as part of that survey, on average, three quarters of people, 73% year over year, I mean, so it's more than one year, 73% of people said access and use of the internet should be a human right. And it, what, one of the things about that that's interesting is in emerging markets in particular, this was the case. In Sub-Saharan Africa, it was 76%. Middle East, North Africa, 75%. Asia, 74%. Latin America, 71%. In Europe, it was only 69%, and North America, 57%. Because in Europe and North America, people take being online for granted. That's at least, we don't know that that's the fact. That's my, you know, presumption Right, that's my hypothesis of why that's lower, because people think, oh, it's like turning the water on on the tap. But when you're in parts of the world where you cannot take the internet for granted, people see it as even more important as something that really should be a human right. So I'll stop there, and I'm happy to dive into any of the more data later, but I wanted to just sort of maybe set the scene with, you know, connectivity, why it's important for human rights um, broadly, um, and how there are real data that reinforce that from both people who are online and from people who are not yet online. And then we can have a conversation about how do we get people online uh, so that they can benefit from being online um, in ways that serve human rights. Thank you. I'm going to follow on with another economist story <laughs> um, um, from 2014. And I know some of the people involved in this, so it's a true story. Well, I, I know the company. It's called Liquid Telecom. They provide fi um, fiber, a lot of fiber connectivity in sub-Saharan Africa. And the point of telling you this is uh, to focus on the importance of diversity of networks for um, access, of course, lowering prices, and competition, and bringing in more people to the global internet. Liquid Telecom has been providing connectivity for years and years, and one of the hardest things for them to do is get fiber across borders. Now, it will change with the Leos that are going up, but that's got a whole another cross-border issue, which I'd love to hear Pepper's opinion on and folks in the room later. But this one is about how hard it was to take fiber from Zambia to South Africa. Um, the team had to get in a boat after about, they, there were negotiations going on for over a year between the two countries. And part of the hang up was a, an historic bridge. So um, a cultural ministry was involved on both sides of the border. The telecom ministries were involved on both sides of the border. The border patrol was involved on both sides of the border. The regulators were, <laughs> get the picture? The regulators were involved on both sides of the border. So a year goes by and there's still no fiber deployed, a year. Now if you're going into business and you're deploying fiber, um, your business model is not a year's wait. It's, it's get the fiber out, get it deployed, you have the investment. And Liquid does do a lot of great work with developing communities as well, so we're not just talking about a big corporate giant that doesn't think about working with communities that have been unconnected and underserved. They finally put some people in a boat, and the article in The Economist is from July 5th, 2014, where they said the connectivity between the two countries was nearly thwarted by a swarm of bees. Because they had put the fellow in the boat, a bunch of bees started to attack the fellow. The CEO took off one of his shirts, wrapped around the guy's head, they got in the boat, they took the fiber across the river. This is a true story. There have been other stories like this in, in, all around the world where you have these border issues now, of course, there are going to be complications in some parts of the world, but this is more of a government's just not coming together and negotiating those agreements to quickly get connectivity deployed across those borders. 
Of course, with mobile networks, it's a little different. Sometimes that's a power level issue. <laughs> I used to live in Armenia, and there were all sorts of power level issues where people would blast the signals too much from one country to another, and you were picking up the signal from um, one operator that you didn't intend to have and paying a lot more money. But the point of this story is that there are ways that connectivity can be deployed, but it just gets hung up. If you're advocating for connectivity from a grassroots perspective, you can help with governments. I've worked with Pepper and others here at this table talking to governments. I was government years ago. It does take a multi-stakeholder approach to make sure that governments understand, whether it's from a corporate perspective or a nonprofit perspective, that there are things that need to be done in order to speed up connectivity. The liquid story is, of course, one about a company. I used to work on, I've worked on many community network projects and I helped lead a movement here back in 2016 in Guadalajara. When I was at the Internet Society, we brought about 40 different community network advocates together from all walks of life to talk about the importance of working together. And as a collective, you can often have more power when you're trying to negotiate whether you're in an ITU meeting or you're here and you're talking to others. When you're, when you're bringing certain concepts together that are similar and you can share those stories and come up with talking points together. Because if you're by yourself, sometimes you're not going to make that difference uh, when you're negotiating with um, folks that may have more power, quite frankly. Community networks have come in from a diversification perspective to bring in last mile and minimal connectivity. When you talk about community networks, it's not in the manner, at least what we were advocating at the Internet Society and what I still advocate um, when I was with a startup. Community networks or community networks can provide different types of connectivity that some of the bigger providers may not be interested in providing because they don't get a return on investment in certain communities because time and distance equals money, right? And if there are only a certain number of people in a certain place, some providers can't, don't go in there because they can't get that return. The smaller networks, some of these are fixed wireless, some of them are just Wi-Fi mesh networks, are creating change and most recently, um, I was working with some folks in a place called East Carroll Parish, Louisiana, that had been named the poorest town in America, and they were tired after the pandemic because they weren't connected. So this is another story of where public-private partnerships were something called capital stacks, which is just a fancy term for putting a lot of different types of money together, whether it's concessional capital and or um, philanthropic, which means foundations, grants, banks coming together, companies who can provide those loans as well, and that's what the capital stack means, stacks of different types of funding. Blended finance is the other fancy pants term for this. It's just lots of different funds coming together to de-risk investment, and you can do that in small towns and in poorer communities. And this is what a group called Connect Humanity is doing, uh, the startup I was working with before. Other organizations are looking at this, even some of the folks in the UN and the GIGA project. I'm not speaking for them. I do work with them, adjacent to them, um, on a project. But I would just say that you're finding more innovative ways to bring in these PPPs that are very different from the huge infrastructure projects like the dams and roads that we saw in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, I suppose, too. Infrastructure, infrastructure is expensive. If you talk to anyone, um, in the space who's building out that connectivity. It's billions of dollars to build networks, but it also can be supplanted with the M's <laughs> and the tens of thousands of dollars with these smaller networks. So um, I'm just here to throw out that there are ways that different types of organizations can work together to achieve the same thing, which is connecting the unconnected and digital skills training. That's a whole separate issue I won't get into, but I'm more on the infrastructure side. There are ways to work together, and it's not as if the capital out there is something evil. You've got to look at capital in a very clinical way when you're working at that grassroots level also. Be as smart as the banks are. Be as smart as the people that are putting this infrastructure together. Thank you. I think we have a few. Thank you. Um, my name is Thomas Lohninger from uh, the Austrian Rights NGO Epicenter Works, and I am surely here on this table the one with the least expertise from on the ground when it comes to, to building community networks. Um, but I absolutely think that this is one of the key issues that uh, should be um, in the focus of this IGF and the digital rights debate in general. And what I might be able to contribute in that regard is to point out how debates that we are 
um, having right now globally, but particularly in Europe, are actually working against achieving this goal of connecting the unconnected. Um, the first thing is that I really want to call out some of the um, PR campaigns that we have seen from the telecom industries in recent years. I mean, uh, that whole debate around 5G with all of the promises what it should bring, nothing of this is materialized. And I think uh, it would have been, that money would have been far better spent actually bringing connectivity of normal, best effort, end-to-end -end internet to all corners of the world and doing it in an affordable manner. Because of course, satellite internet is available everywhere, but it also needs to, for, to, to come to the people in the form of a device that can be powered, that can be sustained uh, in the local circumstances. And now we have debates around 6G already. Uh, while we just see all of the promises of 5G just imploding in themselves. There's no killer app, there is no new technology that's just empowered by that. It is, at best, a little bit of a faster internet connection. And what do we see in the countries where this already exists? People are actually not interested. If you have a 100 megabit or 300 megabit connection, there's very little reason as a consumer to upgrade. So I would really question the premise of a lot of the international telecom debates. And um, we should ask the question if that energy, that focus, and that money is well spent. Um, and I think we just simply have bigger problems. And then there is a second big issue that I want to raise, which also ties into this whole issue of um, connecting everyone on the globe together. And that is the issue of network fees. Uh, it's also often dubbed fair share or fair contribution. Um, this idea, which uh, currently is making the round because Etno, the European Telecom Operators Association, was quite successful in lobbying um, a former CEO of France Telecom who is currently serving as digital commissioner in the EU to adopt this idea. Um, it is a very old idea. We know it uh, from the telephony era. It's basically, uh, you want to reach my customers, you have to pay me money. This idea of the telephony era um, is forced upon the interconnection world. So whenever autonomous networks connect with each other, the so-called interconnection sphere, um, uh, according to the fair share network fee proposal, uh, there needs to be a lot of money exchanged before that connection can be made. And if you just think that through, you will see many problems. Um, and one particular is that uh, smaller networks will suffer. We already have many small ISPs saying that they are actually uh, afraid of their ability to compete, of their ability to connect to other networks um, if such a proposal were to really come, become law of the land. Uh, because when you are right now looking at the interconnection world, um, this is not an area to make profit. This is usually nerds connecting networks with each other. It's where we um, see that some um, connection is congested and that we have a packet loss. Okay, let's just put another cable there. And maybe the money that this cable and the connection itself will cost is the price that you have to pay. But it's not a way to make money. Uh, we see some telecom operators already abusing interconnection as a tool to maximize their profits. And if this were to be the law of the land, if every interconnection would have to follow this principle, then I think we would see many more problems in the global internet in terms of uh, right now you can connect to every other point of the internet, which is what we call end to end. Uh, this could be a concept of the past and maybe we will wake up in a splinter net or in a fragmented internet where only a few big telecom companies are able to really be reachable globally, um, but all the others might actually have a far lower chance of connecting and um, that would certainly deteriorate the ability of particularly global majority countries to connect to privacy friendly alternatives to let's say Google or Meta. And then um, the last thing that I also want to, to, to mention, because there's a very interesting court case going on in the Constitutional Court of Colombia, is the issue of zero rating. So the price differentiation, if you make certain data packages more expensive or cheaper than others. And uh, in many global majority countries, that is um, a very common way of connecting. So when you buy a SIM card, you have free WhatsApp or 
uh, free Facebook or other services that are given to you, no matter if you have gigabytes in your SIM card or not. And that, of course, gives uh, an unfair advantage to the companies that are um, in, in a pole position if they are the only ones reachable uh, for people that uh, otherwise would only have a telephone number and not be able to access the full internet. And uh, I think Free Basic is certainly an, a project that needs to be discussed in that context. And uh, it's, it's my hope that uh, the Colombian court follows the example from Canada, from India, from Europe, to actually outlaw zero rating as a practice that is violating net neutrality. Because if we want to bring meaningful connectivity to everywhere in the world, that needs to encompass the whole internet and just not a walled garden and a handful of selected services. Thank you. Um, now we're going to have Natalia that is going to be online. Right, she can. Okay. Hello. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for waiting for me. Uh, I had some trouble getting in. Um, let me try to share my... Can you all see it there? Yes, we can see it, but if, can you put it in um, show mode? Yeah. yeah. There you go. Great. Thank you. So um, I'm going to talk about a little bit what we have been doing in Brazil. Um, uh, on uh, connectivity. So it... it Talks a, talks a lot with what you all have said, uh, principally uh, Jane and Pepper. So let me tell you a bit of what we have been, how, what is Brazil, okay? And what, what is our challenge? So Brazil is the fifth largest country in geographical area. Uh, we have 2,203 uh, million people and we have the largest city in Latin America with 12.3 million people and over 5,500 municipalities and more than actually 40,000 localities. Uh, the largest uh, economy in Latin America and look at our size. Well, there's lots of Europe there. We have great parts of um, Africa. So you can see the, the size of our challenge, uh, connecting all the people that are in, that are in our Brazilian territory, territory is uh, a challenge, uh, especially when you've got uh, mainly uh, people that you cannot make, you, you can't give for granted any type of technology. You need to have them all uh, working together so that we can get everyone inside the internet. So one of our, uh, all basically all the policies that we do have in Brazil uh, regarding um, connectivity have been uh, facing the supply side. So how do we get uh, networks into the people? Uh, today, we managed to get over 90% uh, of our households with connectivity. And how do we achieve the rest of the 10%? That's the deal. So in our 5G auction that we held in November of 21, 
Uh, we had the 5G obligations that uh, put an over 90% of all economic value into um, coverage commitments. Let me talk to you that uh, over $9 billion uh, were uh, in revenue of this uh, spectrum uh, auction and 90% of it converted to obligations. Most of the different difference was paid over reserve price and converted into commitments. And these commitments were into investments until 2030. And they, are, they go through 4G obligations in localities. We have over 7,500 7, localities that are going to have 4G mobile broadband that had no service at all. Uh, we're going to have 5G obligations in all 5,570 municipalities. And we have also the North, uh, the Connected North. This, uh, this one is our very dearest um, project as we have, we're going uh, to a region in the north and to the Amazonic region that uh, connectivity is still uh, poor in terms of quality, in terms, in terms of resilience and in terms of price. So we are deploying uh, 12,000 kilometers of fiber optic ca cables into the riv river Amazon riverbeds and making sure that this is uh, the capex is just is public, but who does the maintenance and operation of this, these cables afterwards are a consortium of 12 different um, operators that will explore this and do all the maintenance. It's not easy uh, maintaining a, a cable, uh, these fiber cable optic, um, this optic fiber uh, along riverbeds as it's um, that you have many uh, kinds of um, like anchors in the in the rivers that from the from the boats that can do uh, that can rip off the the fiber the optic cables we have um, many issues regarding uh, it's regarding uh, logs on the on the rivers there are many issues that make it quite expensive and this is turning everything into possible so the public partnerships are coming into this um, into this sense so why is this so important for uh, enabling uh, our, uh, uh, human rights well uh, things have this is what we're doing there in the Amazon so this is all our uh, what our boats are doing, deploying the, the fiber, the optic fiber cables. And why is it so important? Uh, well, it's transforming lives in the in the in this region. So we we have regions there that had no internet and hospitals had no had no way to put their protocols inside and they were they used to have um, post office uh, shipping off those the the information on the patients, and now they can have access to a simple system where they can put all the information inside. And now they have access to more resources. May there be uh, into medication, into um, amount of. Uh, uh, of, of money that it gets to, to attend to their patients and uh, telemedicine with the best hospitals in Sao Paulo for the people that live there. So uh, there you go, uh, and schools. In the 5G auction, we also have uh, a budget for connecting schools. It's uh, a little less than $1 billion, but uh, then we are going. We are seeking to do uh, the full connectivity there, not only the speed getting into uh, the schools, but also uh, the, all the Wi-Fi and uh, what we, what this, what the schools are going to do with this uh, pedagogical use. 
So that's a bit of how we used uh, the 5G auction to bring in some other perspectives that is not only uh, the private uh, perspective, but public policy. So we also have the universal fund uh, to structure all that we need. So we have uh, many um, sunk, uh, sunk loss um, projects to do with this funding and especially uh, for public points and doing transportation. So we have subdesired, we had we have many financing lines with subdesired um, revenue. And so here we go. We, we, ha we have this uh, summary of um, commitments. We have funds to make private investments viable. And we are also talking about now going into public policies in the demand side uh, about usage, about wanting to make tangible benefits from internet usage into people's lives. So I uh, thank you, that's all for now. Thank you, Natalia. Uh, sorry, is this? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. And do you ha do we have questions or because I think I see people here that ah. So Natalia, th that um, you point out something that's actually really really important. One of the biggest barriers to getting people connected is less in the access network, the backhaul and metal mile is absolutely one of the barriers. So the project by laying the fiber in the river, in the Amazon, to bring broadband connectivity to those regions, right, that is essential. And um, a, another example of that is something that we did partnering with Airtel and a small company called BCS in Uganda uh, back in 2017, 2018. Um, Airtel had a 4G network uh, across uh, the, you know, Kampala, the urban areas in Uganda. But it did not have 4G on its cell site. It had cell sites across Uganda and covered about 90% of the population. Um, but in the rural northwest part of Uganda, uh, it was 2G. It was GSM, 2G, some SMS. They couldn't do the internet. Um, and the reason was they couldn't get backhaul to the tower sites. They only had narrowband microwave, so they couldn't actually get broadband to the towers. One of the projects that we did was build a um, wholesale backhaul network, 770 kilometers across northwest rural Uganda, where there were no roads across the Nile, can help, and it was an open cable, so there were there was capacity for all the operators. Right. And it enabled Airtel to convert from 2G to 4G once they got broadband to the cell sites. So this is actually very analogous um, to the project in Brazil, which is like really, really important. Um, uh, I would like to, though, uh, Thomas, just respond very, very quickly. Uh, the zero rating thing is extremely important. Um, and I do think that you know, the, there was an evolution from free basics, which was limited, to a less than perfect, but much, much better, and actually a net neutral called Discover, because it uses a proxy server. So any application is, or website is available, um, as opposed to having to have the selection on the old free basics, which is a eight to 10 year old uh, project. And what's interesting is, the way people use it actually benefits people it's because it's not a um, uh, a degraded internet. The way a lot of people are using it is either one of two ways: an introduction to being online, and then people actually want to be online. One of the evolving uses of it is actually, I think, extraordinarily pro. Um, consumer, and that is especially in emerging markets, low and it's it's in you know dozens of countries. Um, 
people who rely on prepaid data packs, data plans. What happens is that in the past, when they ran out of um, their data plan and they could not afford to top up, they were disconnected. But what's happening in many, many cases in many countries is that when people finish, fill up, they've run out of their data plan, they, using the zero rating version of the narrowband um, connection, stay connected so they have something, and then when they can top up, they go back to their full plan. And so it actually helps both the consumer and the operator in that there's no transaction fee of having to be reconnected, redo plans, or anything else. So again, it's, it's, it's not perfect, but it has a very, very positive social and consumer benefit. But the idea is, eventually, I mean, everybody will want to be on the fully accessible internet with all of the applications. Um, and that's, I think, everybody's goal. But, um, and by the way, when the FCC um, had its, you know, net neutrality rules, which were very stringent under the Wheeler Commission, they found that there was nothing inherently anti-net neutrality related to zero rating. There were some zero rating services that they found anti-competitive and violated net neutrality. There were others that were net neutral and that were pro-consumer. And so it was nothing inherent in zero rating that was anti-competitive. Um, and in fact, that was even before some of these other, other developments. And so it's not black and white. Um, and I think it's also a good example of where we're extremely aligned on some things and not on others, which is absolutely fine. I mean, that's, that's actually a good thing. But I didn't know how familiar you were with Discover or the way people are now using it, especially in emerging markets, to bridge top-ups so that they can stay connected at least at a basic level and then they top up and then they have the full internet experience. Maybe if we can go into that point. Um, so the problem with zero rating is really what, what we have seen in the market and it's worth really looking at those concrete offerings and also how they are priced. Um, when you go today to the English-speaking Wikipedia article for net neutrality, you will still find the picture of that article. It's the infamous SmartNet offer from the Portuguese incumbent provider Mail. Um, if you look closer in that offer, a gigabyte of YouTube was 54 times cheaper than normal internet gigabytes. So we have a drastic difference in affordability of certain services over others. Um, and this internet a la carte where, where individual applications are bought is certainly the worst thing where we can all agree. Yeah. Um, and the, there is certainly has been an evolution to class-based zero rating offers. I think those were considered um, in Canada and then they, they scrapped it. They said like that's actually not a viable option. In Europe that was the um, reading of regulators how uh, zero rating could be admissible from 2016 until 2021. And in 21, the European Court of Justice found that no, it's actually contrary to equal treatment of traffic if you price differently. And why did the court find that? Because it's actually an additional effort on the side of the telecom company to calculate packages differently, to have not just your monthly allowance, but a monthly allowance for this service, for this service, and for the rest of the internet. So it is, I think, it's hard to make a case from the perspective of a telecom operator why it should be um, easier and cheaper to roll out these zero rating offers instead of, as you just said, the goal, and I think we agree on that, is an application agnostic form of of access. And that could be a low bandwidth. That could be something that's tailored for um, uh, maybe low energy devices or other particular needs where um, you simply will not be able to stream 4K video. It's totally fine. Um, but the, the thing that we all want to avoid is that once the monthly data cap is cut off, you're left with nothing or you're only left with WhatsApp. 
because I feel like there there always needs to be the freedom to choose. And if discovery is that, then I'm, 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 I haven't looked into it, I cannot speak to it. Um, but I think it's important that we understand the, the rights also from low income households to have the freedom to choose all um, all things of the internet. And I mean, it's also the freedom to innovate, which is most at stake with the zero rating office. I mean, when Mark Zuckerberg created the Facebook.com, he did so because he had a full-fledged internet connection in his dormitory and, and, and wasn't limited to a consumer-only version of the internet. Yeah, and, and, and that's why um, the, uh, the newer versions of that, so that so first the FCC found that there were some of zero rating services where there was discriminatory pricing for some video versus other video as provided by the telco, all right, in, in terms of the way zero rating was implemented. Um, on the other hand, if you think about a service like Discover, right, would think about sort of a dial-up, a, a low bandwidth version, right? So if it's low bandwidth, right, you're not gonna have streaming video, right? So it's just a low bandwidth version but it's not just WhatsApp. So it's not a separate WhatsApp service versus um, being online. It's actually a zero rated service that would be essentially everything, but at a very low speed rate until you top up. And so again, it's, it's not black and white. And I'm happy to take that offline to have that conversation because I think it's an important difference in distinction as things have evolved, and also the consumer behavior of using it as a bridging access for everything but at very low data rate until they top up and then get the full experience. And so it's, again, it's, I don't think it's, it's black and white or either or. I think the more important point, going back to um, uh, the earlier part of the conversation, is some of the you know, ways in which telcos are wanting to have network fees, they call it fair share, um, which is based upon the architecture and the economics of telecom termination monopoly. So the, the reality is you can have a lot of uh, choice on the originating end. So I may have four or five operators that want my business. And so there's a lot of competition. Once I select my operator, right, your network, if we want to talk to each other, if you want to send me messages or videos or whatever, the termination is a monopoly because there's only, once I pick my network, your network must terminate, there's no choice. And that's why the, um, and a lot of this was purely accidental, in Europe, there was the development of calling party pays or sender network pays, and that created and reinforced a termination monopoly. In the US, by just a different model, we had a bill and keep arrangement. So I pay for my airtime, whether I'm originating, sending, or receiving. That eliminated the termination monopoly. And as a result, um, the the, the choice of the network connection is where it should be on the originating end. Now, what does that mean? It means that if the telecom networks want to use termination monopoly on interconnection, they want to use termination monopoly to raise fees, they want to use termination monopoly to extract rents because they have that, if they interconnect to me, it's a monopoly, right? And in fact, the European Commission, as you know, in looking at uh, mobile roaming, defined termination as a separate market with significant market power. And that's at the, at the core, the crux of the, a lot of the, um, uh, what we're hearing from the telcos on the uh, fair share and uh, network fee issue. There's one person waiting for um, <clears throat> uh, Thank you. My name is Jarrell James, and I have some questions because I'm hearing a lot about um, capitalization of bandwidth and how people would need to spend more money to get access to be able to stream. You know, if they're 
um, data packages are running out and this idea of like topping off or even creating like subsidies to allow for topping off into these communities. Um, I think it's really interesting to focus uh, maybe on the fact that, that premise is really locked into the traditional way we're used to dealing with data, which is coming from a Western, more developed com community and not I think the days of us were counting minutes and counting data packages is long gone for many people in the West. And so what I'm wondering about is when we look at an internet in the future where streaming platforms are gonna have higher quality videos that are gonna require more bandwidth, and we're trying to like, you know, do these mitigations, is it not also valuable to look at what happens when you take those resources like videos and high bandwidth resources that people are regularly looking for? Um, as this gentleman over here in the green tie actually was speaking in his session a few days ago, um, I don't even think he knows I'm referencing him. Uh, he was mentioning that a lot of people do brick lane as like a, a, a regular thing that's Googled, right? And that is uh, advancing their career. Why would someone need to regularly Google that five or six times instead of just having access to that video because many members in their community have that? And so this is where I'm curious about we potentially looking at the way that telecos are gamifying gamifying data access and not doing very obvious like now it's very obvious movements to ensure that while they are able to mine the transaction of data for communication purposes between people and they can say hey yeah we can provide you with communication access does that really mean that every resource that is beneficial to that person's life, which objectively is a lot of educational resources, should also be reliant on that person's ability to create monetary value for themselves and then give it to teleco companies so they can somehow learn skills and achieve a greater life. It seems like a catch-22, and, and it seems very much premised on the idea that we're expecting other communities to pay up and use data packages the way that we've done it. And so these are some of the questions I would have. Um, it's an interesting question. I mean, we uh, had various debates in this in this direction over the years. Um, it reminds me a little bit about Wikipedia Zero, uh, which was a project from the Wikimedia Foundation to zero rate access to um, uh, local Wikipedia uh, versions uh, in in the country. And I think the English speaking Wikipedia was always included as well. And they did this in partnership with uh, telecom companies. Um, and uh, disclosure, they were criticized by many people, including me. And the foundation decided to uh, sunset this project in, I think, 2017, something around that line. Um, and um, one of the reasons why they sunset it is, was it actually didn't work. The access numbers to the zero-rated service were ridiculously low. Um, and, and I never really got an answer what, what their conclusion is, why it was never really, because the, the concept sounds, of course, very good. And, and we had similar fears also in the pandemic, in the lockdowns, that suddenly everything went online. And um, that means low-income households have more potentially only um, caps on the data they can use. Um, a model to, I think in your question, there was also um, a call to think outside of the box. And here it's maybe interesting to look at Finland. In Finland, you cannot find um, um, a, a data plan that has a data cap. Okay. They differentiate uh, by via speed. So it's the bandwidth that you get, but it's always a flat rate. Mm. And this is the much more honest business model because the variable cost for data volume is absolutely negligible, yeah. particularly in mobile. It's expensive to build a network, to connect it, but then afterwards, whether there's data flowing or not, you might have congestion if there are too many people at the same time. But then also a bandwidth-based system is helping you to allocate those resources um, much better than if you uh, right now give everyone a 5G connection with three gigabytes, which can be used up in like one concert if you're streaming it. And um, yeah. So I, I think these, these hard questions about the business model of telecom companies need to be asked. Just a quick uh, question on the point. I, when they were sunsetting that project, was it uh, access numbers in communities that had regular, like, regular connectivity, or were there any numbers that you know of for population? I work with a lot of extensively with populations that have been shut down from the internet, and uh, overwhelmingly the 
information that is looked up and is searched for is oftentimes health related uh, because health facilities be are destroyed inside of conflicts and there's a lot of this uh, questions around this access numbers how much of it was done during in communities that had zero connectivity to the greater world um, as a resiliency uh, as a resiliency measure especially as we go farther into climate change destroying the teleco infrastructure it does seem more valuable to maybe revisit those connection uh, questions and access points good question I cannot give you that answer but there's a Wikimedia Foundation booth around the corner they hopefully have uh, to, to, Thomas to, to your point um, very related the a lot of the of the um, data plans in the, in the name of um, network management are total data consumption, not related to congestion, right? So, you know, two gigabytes, right? Um, if, I, if I'm, you know, downloading that or using that off peak, there is no impact on the network, right? Now, if everybody's trying to access a network at the same time, you end up with congestion. But the reality is, right, um, the, the legacy telco, th their network architecture, their engineering, their business model, and the regulation was all based upon some fundamental principles. The metric was the minute, because it was about voice. The longer the distance, the higher the cost. Um, the longer the duration that you are on, the higher the cost. When you have a flat IP network, and once, you, we, once we got to 4G, it was essentially a flat IP network, even in mobile. There's a cost to the network, but it's a step function. Once you're connected, how much you use that network does not vary until you hit the limit. And that's where the congestion comes in. But if you use it, you know, only a little bit or a lot, as long as you're under that um, technical architecture, the cost is not variable. And yet, you still have legacy models based upon minutes of use, distance and time, which are no longer relevant using the, the flat IP architectures of today's data networks, whether they are wireless or fixed. And that goes to your point, Thomas, which is like really important because a lot of these plans are premised upon total data consumed and that may have no relationship whatsoever to network congestion Right, and you know, go ahead, I mean. Just to, to put a finer point on this, like, or to, to put it bluntly, um, if you are operating a mobile network in a country where connectivity is an issue, and it's late night hours where the network is idle, it's the only reason why there is not a flat rate for everyone is corporate greed. Because it's wasted resource. The bandwidth would be there, it costs them nothing it's just corporate greed and their business model reasons for not opening the floodgates and that people use it. One of the things that was mentioned in the description of the panel as well was innovative policies for um, improving connectivity. There's a, a model that's being explored that's not new, but it's new to the United States-ish. It came out of the European, um, out of the UK called Structural Separation Networks, where somebody might manage the network, build and manage the network, but other networks can run on top of it. And this is a way to also cut down on costs. This is more of the CapEx side and OpEx later, but bottom line is this is coming back in some parts of the US right now where municipalities are asking for more accountability from the companies that are providing connectivity, suggesting that they not run, because I want to be really clear that governments probably aren't the best at running <laughs> networks. Um, there's a reason for that, that so much liberalization happened and there are no more state-owned enterprises. Well, there are some, but um, 
anyway, companies, some companies are better at running the networks at a, at a cost that can help people. But the open access networks allow different types of networks to provide services over the top of the network. So you could have a $10 email only network. And this is, of course, prices that make sense in that economy, but it wouldn't be the same in, a, in an emerging uh, environment. Another company could come in and put the, run their services over that network as well. It could be full on video streaming, who knows, but there are different models being explored. So I think it's important that for many people here who are interested in what could be done, there are lots of other people you can network with. You can talk to some of the community networks that are also coming into play that are actually solid networks, they're not flaky. When people hear the term community network, they're like, oh, a bunch of crazy people running a network. You're like, no, no. <laughs> um, these are smart technologists, people who know to run the network. <laughs> and, it, and it's not um, fly by night in, in that sense. But knowing your business plan, I do want to put this out there, and I, don't, I hope I don't sound too businessy, but you do need to have a thought about how you're going to continue to run your network. It's something that Talia was mentioning. You can't just build that network and hope that you know, people are going to come and <laughs> buy the services. You've, you've got to have a plan, and those plans have to last longer than a year. And you've got to have subsidization or capitalization coming in in order to keep those networks um, operating until you can get a return on your investment. And a lot of the community networks are sort of a zero return, right? The, they can continue to supply the network, but they're not taking a lot off the top. That we should see with Natalia. Did you have anything to say? It's it's difficult to. Yeah. Hello. Uh, do you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Well, um, I believe that uh, the model that's structured today has been able to uh, to achieve a great amount of people to get inside, and that maintenance is fundamental. Uh, if you have no incentives for uh, people to, to stay, to, to maintain their networks, maybe you get some problems on making people go where they don't have the interest to go. So uh, we need to create these incentives. Um, in Brazil, we have uh, a great, um, we, have, we have had a great uh, help from small ISPs, okay? Uh, Today, more than 52% uh, of our fixed networks in fiber uh, is done by small ISPs. And it's not that the big operators have lost market. No, that's not it. It's just a different model that they accept uh, different returns and they have different business plans. And for them, it is a very good structure. They, they sometimes, uh, we, we did have to do some regulatory uh, adoptions like uh, making authorization for these uh, fixed networks easier, uh, helping um, providing some different, uh, some different issues for when they are small ISPs that regulatory uh, large operators have, but these uh, have been have enabled these new business models and making internet viable in this great great amount of localities. Uh, if today we have ninety percent of households with internet, it's because of these models. Um, I believe that it's uh, it's a sustainable model that makes things viable if you have no incentives for corporations to maintain that, uh, then you, you, you won't have them uh, actually doing and then you have the result that people have no internet. So uh, the idea here is that we, we need, people need incentives. Everyone does. Uh, we are driven by incentives. So, uh, what is the incentive that you're gonna make if it's uh, if your network does not receive any any your investment and all the labor that you put in it is not paid off? And then you just don't expand anymore. You don't have new localities being uh, connected. Uh, so 
maybe these models where you have half subsidized and uh, financing and some different models where we can uh, take uh, uh, take by, by the hand and see that, okay, what do you need and what are the facility, what, what can we facilitate for you to, to operate and make these costs a little bit lower so that they can come in. Natalia, it's Jane. Can we ask you a question about universal service in Brazil? Of course. Are you looking at using universal service funds or universal service access funds, sometimes known as USFs or USAFs, are you looking at using those funds to help all types of networks, the smaller ones, like the community networks or the municipal networks, as well as just the traditional uh, telco nets and mobile networks? It's just curious because um, we have a panel tomorrow, Senka and I, who's one of my colleagues, and we're um, talking about universal service funding, but this strikes me that this might be a good topic to also just make folks in the room more aware of. Um, some of them probably are quite aware, but Brazil's been so innovative in so much of what it's been doing in some of this space. I'd be just curious to know if you're reaching out past the traditional telcos to provide USF funding to. Uh, so our USF uh, is was modernized uh, in 2021, and and we have been building it up again from zero. It had never been used before because it was all uh, all dedicated to fixed network to uh, telephony, fixed telephony, and we have and the need for for the usage was uh, close to zero and was very difficult to use. So we had it modernized, and now we can do broadband and uh, uh, connectivity uh, issues, right? Like from ICTs to, uh, to digital transformation. Uh, it's based on uh, three basic models, uh, uh, sunk, sunk, sunk cost uh, projects, um, financing and guarantees. Um, Brazil, these small ISPs have many uh, problems to uh, to access to to financing because of these guarantees that they need to to offer. So uh, the financing lines are almost all dedicated to uh, ISPs, small ISPs, not the traditional operators, okay, uh, with subsidized uh, funding. Uh, the projects, uh, the cost, uh, sunk cost projects, um, we are structuring them, but basically it's that the idea is to give services out and have the best price. So we're talking about, for example, connect, school connectivity. We've got 138,000 schools that we need to connect with uh, Wi-Fi by 2026. Okay, uh, so we're just saying who does it for less? That's the idea. Uh, I don't want to know who's doing it. Uh, I just want the, the, the service to be done, well done, and uh, who gives me the best price so I can do more schools. That's, that, that's the idea about it. Okay. Um, yeah, a follow do you up. have any more? Yeah, follow up Natalia, yeah. to that actually goes to, um, uh, Again, I want to go back to the shift from a coverage gap to a usage gap and affordability of service and affordability of devices. Um, and just as an example, um, in the six, seven year time series, the, it, it's actually quite interesting. Um, among the highest income countries, the usage gap in 2017 was about 15%, and then that declined by 2022 to about 9.5%. In other words, so all but 9.5% of people who could get online with, because they had mobile, or they had a broadband fixed or mobile available, did not. In the lowest income countries, in sub and lowest income countries, mostly sub-Saharan Africa, but not exclusively, the usage gap in 2017 was 76%. 
In other words, 76% of people who could not, who, who, who could be online, were not. That only declined in 2022 to 68%. So the digital divide actually had grown between the highest income countries and the lowest income countries. And it was not because the network was not available. It was because of these other various partic variables, particularly affordability of devices and service. So one of the recommendations that was made, including by the most recently Broadband Commission, was to repurpose some, at least some, of universal service funds to target subsidies for devices since we no longer need as much subsidy on the network side. And there are programs that actually provide subsidies to low-income people, right, and then let them choose who they want their network operator to be. So it actually introduces competition, going back to your point about incentives. So if people have money to buy things, it gives the network operators incentives to serve them, right, and do so competitively. So a question would be for your session tomorrow, and also to Natalia, whether in terms of the 2021 reform of universal service in Brazil, which was huge, it was a huge step forward, um, whether those funds can be used today to subsidize devices, or if there are any funds going directly to low-income people to empower them to buy competitively from operators. Um, so our fund, actually, one of the programs that we do have already established, uh, we can, yes, we can give subsidies to um, small to little income um, families. Okay, we do have structured also a project that's called Internet Brazil, which is giving uh, neutral um, SIM cards, eSIMs, uh, distributing them, and then uh, we can do best uh, best uh, offers for some regions and see which are the best operators in that regions and buy uh, in, in terms of federal uh, or state level uh, procurements and then give access already to the best best price uh, and cost. Uh, availability actually of service uh, for the for those people that have very low income uh, because even that in some places is, is, is a little bit complicated um, for them to 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 buy so the idea is that you have these e sims and then you can do uh, the, the the government can do those procurements and offer the so uh, when the when someone has a better offer, then you can change it without having to change the exams and uh, things like that. So yes, it is something that is structured. There's always a discussion on uh, should we voucher uh, telecom or should we just give uh, give the families uh, the the income so that they can choose whether they use it on telecom or they use it on by meat. That that that's the the that's the last thing. But uh, yes, we do have we do have that in in time. But we still have an issue that we are trying to understand better, which is the what we were commenting is that it's not only about access; it's about um, uh, making it meaningful. So uh, we still have the devices, which we don't have alternatives yet. Uh, how do, can we get better prices here? Which are the, would we adopt some models to give some subdesized um, financing? How, how would that be? This is still something that is to be designed. And that's why we're working on this uh, digital uh, meaningful connectivity plan. Which tries to address, which will try to understand better which are these limits, and affordability goes in that sense that I already told you. But devices are still in, and then we have to uh, also the people that uh, have access, okay, to connection, but they opt 
not to and uh, how how do we bring them into the net and that's the the meaningful connectivity part where it's the usage and making it uh transforming connection into uh tangible benefits that make the difference in their lives. So that really happened in the pandemics. We got many people inside the net because they needed to, uh, to talk to their relatives. They needed to get information online and they needed to have all these, uh, these vaccination uh, information. They needed to have access to public health system. So that was really a driver but we still have many people outside and most of them uh, have has to do with this lack of uh, interest uh, to use, which really is, I don't know how to use it. Yeah, and that's very consistent. Um, and I don't know whether you were connected at the very beginning. I know that you were having difficulties, but it was one of the things that I, you know, discussed from the work that we've done with uh, the Economist Intelligence Unit um, on this shift from coverage to usage gap, and it was affordability, lack of the, the um, people would say, I don't know how to get on or why I should, right? And this is, you know, the relevance of local content, e-gov applications, especially healthcare, uh, and other, and education, um, which, tend to be, you know, many countries, most countries, government functions actually are huge drivers because it actually creates a reason that people will be on and want to use and benefit from being online. And then there's some of the digital literacy issues of how do I get on? How do I get on safely? How do I set my settings? How do I, you know, feel comfortable online? And those are all part of the, um, uh, the readiness issues of getting online. So it sounds like, you know, and I know because of working with colleagues in, in Brazil, Brazil is one of the leaders in, in actually having a broader plan to do that. But more generally, these are the issues that are more now on the demand side than the um, supply side on the network. But it should be, and this goes back to the human rights questions, when you think about all of the components in the you know Declaration of Human Rights, the ability to not just get information, but to be a speaker, right? Information about you know your livelihood, um, healthcare, being healthy, um, and all of those things that are related are on the application side. And those are extremely important, and those are things that actually drive demand. And by the way, the telcos should be interested in that in a positive way because more people get on, they actually are customers um, and they generate revenue. But sometimes, as Thomas pointed out, they do things that are contrary to getting people online, which I don't understand. Hi, everyone. Uh, can you hear me? Oh, yes, okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Nathan. Uh, I'm from Brazil. I work on Data Privacy Brazil. Uh, I have a question to Natalia, if you may answer me, please. <laughs> uh, recently, uh, the, the Brazilian uh, agency, telecommunication agency uh, created uh, a working group on internet community networks, uh, and the Ministry of Communications has a seat on it. Uh, but and I would like to hear a little bit more about what you were doing there. What you're, what are you, uh, what are you planning with this working group? Considering that uh, community networks in Brazil doesn't have any specific regulation and f struggles with a uh, uh, lots of barriers to 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 build themselves uh, uh, in Brazil. So if you could comment on that a little bit, uh, I would appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, I'm the one that's in the working group. <laughs> so, uh, pleasure. Uh, well, the group is discussing exactly what, uh, how, what, how do we uh, build something for community networks? As I said before, uh, we have had a very, uh, ISPs have done a lot of the work that many, many times are, are done by community networks. And 
the idea of this working group is to better understand uh, how they how these community uh, networks uh, actually uh, operate in Brazil and what are their needs how can we structure something because uh, each one is very specific on their models in their uh, in the ways of uh, working in community. So we have to understand how that, how, how can we make uh, specific directives so that we can make specific policies. Uh, we don't, we, it's kind of, um, uh, you, you can't do something on the, uh, on the specific case, it's very difficult. So how can we manage to make these uh, communities viable first? Uh, what are their needs? And how can we, as a public policy, also help these uh, projects go on, go happen, actually happen? Uh, by uh, how, how do we, how do you know that this is a, a good community network and that that's not a good way of going for community networks that not always everyone is uh, is exactly the same. So, uh, so this working group is going to have some study results. And in that sense, uh, from then on, we can do, we can start operating something that works for them. That's the idea. Understand. Hi, hi everyone. I'm Carlos Vaca. I'm from Mexico. I work in, in an organization that calls Rizomatica, and we are actually a community networks, and we help other com uh, communities to uh, get connected through this this model. So. Uh, I just uh, went to Brazil, to the Amazonia in Brazil in, in July, to see what happened with the National School of Community Network there. And, uh, and I saw a si very similar situation with other communities, no? that it is that the WISP that go to the communities have very expensive prices, really, really expensive. No? Uh, in Chihuahua, in Mexico, we, when we work, uh, we have like uh, people need to have at least three dollars or four dollars at, at a day to be connected. So what what the, the young people are doing now to be connected to Facebook, to to YouTube, to WhatsApp, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, is to uh, involve in the in the narco, in the na in the, <laughs> the crime, no, in the organ uh, organized crime, crime, no, the the drugs, the drug sellers, no, they are now. Part of it because in the you know in the north of Mexico we have this problem very very much, and so we are we are seeing that the people to spend a lot of money to be connected. There is a lot of wisp. Uh, so in in very 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 far communities they have one point that it is very bad connection. You know, uh, and sometimes uh, people spend a lot of money to increase these these antennas and this uh, infrastructure for for the wisp, and then. Uh, they need to pay like uh, insurance. The, it is it is a very big problem that we are in seeing because we think that they are doing this job that that it is needed to do. So I am not saying that we need we don't need to work with the WISP, the small ISPs, because we need to have a joint effort. We work a lot with with them in in Mexico, for example. But uh, we need to establish some conditions to to better understand what is happening really in the communities, not only what they are, uh, you know, reporting or saying that they, what they are doing. So I think this is one of the things that I wanted to, to address. And the other one is that as, as the same in, in Oaxaca, uh, and this is a, a, a question for Natalia, and, uh, we detected that there is a lot of fiber in, in you know, in a lot of, of uh, ways, in a lot of, in, in, in the in very near from the communities, but the uh, government doesn't have the uh, policy to access to these uh, fiber networks for the communities. No, so uh, in the Amazonian is they have a lot of expectation about this project. No, is what I found, but uh, they are also thinking what they what they can't 
connect to this to this fiber network no so uh, I think it is important to to reach that and finally uh, of the last question I think it's very very difficult to try to define what is a community network and and you know say that this is a good and this is a bad community network and we need to uh, to understand better that uh, maybe it is the main characteristic is that the people in the in the community can handle in the different ways the infrastructure and the and the services they have. So uh, if you think the the community networks in Africa, there are more like little uh, business models that is very different from one uh, community network in Colombia or in Mexico, where they, there is a lot of uh, political organization. So we need to escape the, some of the things that we think about community networks. As uh, Jane said, uh, they work and work well, no? because we have very, now very good examples of how it's working in the communities. And as the same as the community radios in 10 or, t or 20 years ago, uh, we need to escape to all of these imaginations, all of these, uh, yes, with these thoughts that, that make uh, to say that there are uh, poor, there are not so good, so good services, there are bad bad uh, things, no, no, or there are uh, not in they don't have enough quality, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, no, so we need also to to think uh, this in this in this panel. It's, it's a very complex issue, I know, but uh, try to understand the different uh, the diversity that exists around community networks. Sorry. For it's okay because they're gonna disconnect her in two minutes. So. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I was very surprised about the two, three dollars a day for connection. Well, the idea of the North Connected is that uh, when this is uh, all installed, you have new uh, twelve companies at least uh, working on the region. And some of them are just for uh, capacity. They are just transport operators. So actually you're dealing about much more, uh, much more offer and competition in the region so that these uh, big prices don't happen anymore. Uh, that's why we built, we, we had the idea of building the North Connected, okay? So that competition, so that better quality uh, services get there. So that's, the, that's one point. Uh, the second point is that um, I, what I said about uh, the bad community uh, networks is that how do I not finance none? Um, uh, there are some people that uh, may fake uh, a, a community network so that they get some public financing. And how do I, as a public servant, uh, know that that one is going into those good, uh, those important uh, networks that community networks do work well? Uh, it's not the question if uh, community networks are necessary or not. It's just that uh, how do I uh, just take away the the bad the bad stuff the 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 non um, the non the non legal stuff from the from from the from all this um, group. So uh, that's the idea to better understand that. And there's always something that community networks do that. Others don't, ISPs don't do, which is making the connectivity meaningful. So this uh, appropriation of, uh, of technology, of information, and uh, making the, the learning among that community uh, and distributing information on, on how to better work on that, on that virtual world. So that's something that, uh, we don't know how to do it. Uh, government is still tackling, in Brazil, is still tackling how to deal with that next phase. So uh, I believe that we have all the synergies to, to make this happen. 
It's just only that we need to study it a little bit more so that we can structure something that we can go forward with. Did I answer everything? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everyone. It was... <laughs>